patients have, well, patients with trigeminal neuralgia have some type of abnormal signaling uh, going through that nerve, the fifth cranial nerve or the trigeminal nerve. Of course, they're going to know what that's all about. Um, a lot of the time we believe it is a blood vessel, which is essentially pounding on the nerve and bothering it and causing pain. Sometimes it may be something else we don't understand. Sometimes it's multiple sclerosis. Uh, actually, I had a patient today that had a, a tumor actually sitting on top of the trigeminal nerve causing trigeminal neuralgia type pain. Uh, but a lot of the neurologists end up... Um, once they diagnose the patient with this condition, which is basically a unilateral one-sided pain that can affect either the top, middle, or bottom, or any combination of the, the three areas of the three branches of the trigeminal nerve, um, they you know usually their workup uh, may include well the history, which basically is a classical presentation of typically sharp pulsating pain. Uh, sometimes exacerbated by touching or some other stimulus, even touching the face, washing the face, eating, just moving those areas might cause pain. Um, but typically there's nothing really on the physical exam except for maybe it's really exquisitely tender to touch, um, but everything else looks totally normal. There's um, The scans might look pretty normal. Uh, although occasionally they might find a little tiny blood vessel that's possibly the culprit. And oftentimes you start out with, well, usually you'll start out with medical therapy, which is what the neurologists do. They'll prescribe various medications that will lower that nerve signal through that, um, the painful nerve signal that's going through that nerve. Uh, but occasionally patients get what we call medically refractory, where the pain is too strong to be held back by the medicine, or if you give too much medicine to control the, well, if you give enough medicine to control the pain, then perhaps um, the medicine causes too many side effects. So if that occurs, then oftentimes people will move on to something that's a little bit more, I don't want to call it drastic, but more of an intervention. Um, and that intervention sometimes is this microvascular decompressive surgery, which the neurosurgeons do, uh, where they cut a, open, a hole open in the back of the head using a microscope, getting to that center part of the head, looking for the trigeminal nerve and any potential blood vessel that's blocking it, and separating the nerve and the blood vessel um, and putting a little pad or a pillow in between. Now, that's really more of a neurosurgeon's thing. Uh, some other things that they might do are ablative procedures where they put a needle through the face to that point and they can inject glycerol or use a, a special tool to compress the nerve to try to stop that nerve signal or even deliver what's called a radiofrequency rhizotomy where, you know, these things are pretty invasive where we're actually trying to cause a lesion, some type of disruption of that nerve. Um, but one of the options that we have to offer is stereotactic radio surgery, and that can be done with CyberKnife, and there might be other modalities out there. Uh, and the idea behind this is we're focusing really strong doses of radiation to that same nerve, because we know something's going on through that nerve pathway. And if we use a tool like CyberKnife, which basically has a rotating arm that goes around in multiple different angles, um, the idea is that we can deliver a beam of radiation that's pointed exactly at that nerve, and then we move it on to another angle and deliver another beam of radiation, strong, high-energy x-rays that cumulatively deliver such a strong dose that it disrupts the nerve signal. Now, typically, most patients will respond in terms of having less pain. So there are a lot of people that have relief of pain. Typically, it does take a little while. Typically, it takes six to eight weeks on average, but that average can be, well, that span of response can be during the treatment up to maybe more than six months, maybe closer to a year. Um, but the vast majority of patients do have improvement of pain. Some of those patients actually have complete relief of pain. Um, some of those patients might have partial relief of pain. Some of them might still need medication. Some of them don't. 
uh, but most patients are pretty happy that they have a reduction in you know, what's typically considered the, the worst pain known to mankind. So we do think that we have a pretty good thing that can benefit people. Yes, there are risks. There are risks of us causing the nerve to be numb, which can have other consequences. Like if you get dust in your eye, you don't feel it, you don't blink, you don't make tears. So that can cause a, a complication of the eye. There might be some numbness of the face that feels like you've been to the dentist and that that numbness may go away or may not. And so sometimes there are some people that have permanent numbness of the face. So that is probably the, one of the one of the probably more common downsides is that um, some people do feel numb, but most patients that we see are so desperate to have improvement of pain that they accept that risk as risk of numbness. It's not that high of a risk, but it is a risk. Um, so you just feel like you've been to the dentist for, you know, on that side of the face. And that's could be a pretty odd feeling, I believe. Um, so there's some definite benefits, but there are some definite risks. Um, although the risks are relatively minor.